Hi everybody, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And I'm Drew. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And yes, as we men- as mentioned, we have a special guest joining us today. This is Drew Ripley, famous entertainer. Moving up in the world. Yeah, locally famous. Um, oh, no, actually internationally known balloon twister. That's fair, yeah. All yes. Right. Okay. Uh, you can find links to Drew's Twitter and his website in the show notes, as well as something really cool that he did. We'll pick one. The car, the shuttle. The dinosaur. The dinosaur. Like, yeah, there's there's a ton. Drew makes awesome things out of balloons. Uh, but today, he is not here to talk about balloons. But it is a super weird job. I'm not talking about balloons? No. Well, I mean, you can. Okay. Good. You're not brought here specifically to talk about balloons. You do that enough. Okay. But, uh, no, today we want to talk about weird jobs mm-hmm. and weird job stories. Mm-hmm. The icebreaker is... How many jobs? And I actually want to. I want to follow this with how old are you? Fair. So I guess I go first. Uh, yes. All right. So as of recording, I am twenty-eight, and in the pre-show, I counted at least fourteen jobs. Uh, I started just after. I think you're legally old enough to get your um, social insurance card to work. I think it's like fourteen. For summer jobs, mm-hmm. uh, and I won't go through all of them, but the highlights are: I started off in corn detasseling for a little bit, like two weeks. Awesome! Yeah, <laughs> first time ever. Corn detasseling is a highlight. Yeah, uh, and then my ne- my big boy, my first big boy job was I worked in a uh, at a golf course in the um, the hall, setting up for wedding receptions and such. I worked as a section sergeant at a cadet camp. Uh, fast forward a little bit uh, Restoration company for fire, flood, and natural disaster um, My first big boy job out of university Was working in the gambling lab um, Studying slot machines and going to casinos and recruiting people uh, And then I guess the, the first job that I got entirely on my own By applying and whatnot was Probably working at Conestoga College, which is where I am now. I'm on my third job there uh, because of the wonderful joys of contract work. So those are the highlights, and there's a couple other really cool ones and fun stories in there, but we'll talk about that later. All right. I guess if we're going in order of age, I am next. Uh-oh. I'm getting old. <laughs> As of the recording of this, I am 32, and I, have we counted... I've had 23 jobs uh, at a penny saver route when I was like 10. And I sort of stopped for a while and started again when I was 17. But uh, I have worked in bars, I've worked in construction, I have worked in retail, I've worked in libraries, I have worked for universities, I have had internet jobs where I do everything on the internet and get paid. Um, I counted things for a living once. Which, let me tell you, counting sandpaper sucks. Oh. It sucks. I'm just, I'm just saying. Yeah, that would hurt. There's me. no estimation. You have to count it, and it sucks. True. Did you get gloves at all, or is it just straight, like... No, no, I didn't get gloves. I mean, I probably could have if I'd asked for them, but I was... It was... It was at that point, we'd been on that site for 12 hours, and I, we really just wanted to go home, and... Fair enough. Well, I'm 36, as of right now. And uh, from what I can remember, 22 jobs, um, although I feel like I'm missing some on that list. The first one, amazingly enough, the first thing I was ever paid for was to be a, ma- a magician. And then after that, paper route, snow shoveler, uh, camp counselor, fire marshal at the camp, canoe director, uh, co-op, obviously, through university. That mixes things up. Favorite highlight, though, uh, uh, some people might remember this place, Kids Zone Family Fun Center. That was a fun place. Mm-hmm. Really liked working at that one. Just because we're at a playground all day. And that's good life. Uh, and of course, now I'm back to being a balloon twister. Refined magician. Maybe that's what I'll go with. <laughs> refined magician. I like that. Magicians everywhere. You can find Drew on Twitter. <laughs> at Drew Ripley. I refined my magician talents into balloons. Fair enough. Fair there, enough. That's fair. Because I, I know many very talented magi- magicians. And this is my route. Oh, man. So, yeah. I mean, the, the, the title of today is, is Weird Job Stories. And it started out as just sort of weird jobs that people could have 
there are. Oh, there are tons, but I mean, we realize that we have had a lot of weird jobs. And I mentioned that I, I counted things for a living. I, work, I used to work in a bar when I was 17. That was one of my first jobs. Uh, I filled bars because you couldn't tend bar or anything like that uh, in Ontario until you were at least 18. But it was in a biker bar. Not that far from my house. And I would, I would, I would go there on Friday and Saturday nights. And I would fill bars. And it was a pretty good time. I'd be at work until like 2, 3 in the morning. I got to interact with a lot of drunk people, which I had never done before. But I worked the Hell's Angels Christmas party. And lived to tell the tale. It was actually not it was not that stressful. Like they like I, I did I bust a lot of dishes, which wasn't a thing I was used to, but apart from that, everybody was super nice. I mean as far as I understand it, the Hell's Angels are super nice to people who don't pose any threat to them, like seventeen year old boys. Yeah. Uh, there was, however, a different night when um, I did have a brush with death. I was, it was like a Saturday night, I was filling bars like normal, and the bar had this little sort of raised area where, usually where the bikers would hang out. It was like the, the sort of, it wasn't a VIP area, but it was a VIP area. You know I mean, and a whole bunch of big dudes in leather jackets started coming in and this was normal I mean big dudes in leather jackets were the order of the day the, the back half was it was you know big dudes in leather jackets and the front half was people dancing to Moni Moni and whatever other <laughs> uh, Sandstorm Sandstorm yeah, was yeah, huge at the time yep and I looked as I'm coming back from one of the bars and I noticed that these guys are not wearing Hell's Angels jackets they're wearing Satan's Choice uh, jackets I should point out that we live in Canada um, and in the states, you will you're talking of like the mafia and things like that, you know, the families or whatever. In 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 Canada, we we have sort of one organized crime um, syndicate, and that is that is the Hell's Angels. Like that's like our jam. Um, and Satan's Choice was an opposing biker gang at the time, and I just sort of saw saw them there. I saw them coming in, there were quite a lot of them, and they were going to that area, and I'm just like, wow. I wonder if the, f- the cooler I work in is bulletproof, because I should probably go there now. Uh, it turned out that they were having a patchover party. They had absorbed the Satan's Choice bikers, and so they, they, they had this big party, and everybody sort of switches over their jackets, and now I guess it's a thing that people see in Sons of Anarchy, but I had no idea what it was. I was just like, wow, these are two biker gangs that I know don't get along. I should be elsewhere. <laughs> something really important to do on the other side of the building. <laughs> I just... I'm gonna... Hide behind some kegs or something. I'm gonna take a smoke break. You don't smoke. I, I'm gonna start. <laughs> right? Now. Right now. I, I, I've never really been thinking about it. <laughs> you went for heroin. That would have been. It was. It was momentarily harrowing. As soon as they got to the, like, I, I'm exaggerating a little. As soon as they got to the, you know, the thing, and, and nobody was seemed really upset. I was like, oh, okay. I guess everything is cool. Is for, for certain values of cool. <laughs> but that was the. I think the closest I ever had to a near death experience on the job. Near death experiences for me would be in training towards the job, but not actually on the job. Nothing oh. that I can think of. Yeah, yeah. Because in that mix of jobs, uh, stunt training, uh, I learned that I'm not very good at jumping out of buildings. Once I get to about forty feet, I struggle at that height, and I screwed up once. And I still have a little scar on my. That's good. I, I'm not very good at jumping out of buildings. I, I have five feet, and I start to really bulk. That, that's really good. That. My apartment's only five feet off. So the you're okay. So you go, yeah. get out of his, but that was, you know, if I ever need to escape from Huck's apartment, that's how I'm doing it. And that wasn't really a job. It was more that was training. And in the training, then there was only a couple shoots that we tried to do that didn't really turn into anything much. But officially, based on our rules of what is a job, uh, which was a thing that you get paid to do. That mm-hmm. yep. So which which did qualify. But uh, no, I can think of other ones that. When I was a lifeguard, and actually, I, I enjoyed being a lifeguard. I, I enjoyed being a lifeguard. I don't know if I was ever in jeopardy. I think looking back, I never was. But obviously, the person that I was assisting mm-hmm. was in serious trouble. And 
I don't know if that's a weird story. That's actually very... It's, to me, it's a very good story because it, the few times where something very serious happened, not just, you know, a scraped knee or something, but, like, you know, we're dealing with a drowning or a, a, a potential drowning. Uh, I had one where a kid, he, he'd fallen off the dock and gotten himself partially trapped under the dock. That was... Um, obviously very harrowing for him and fairly stressful for me, but worked out worked out well. And gave me a certain level of appreciation for you know, you, you go through all the um, there used to be when it, when I would take my CPR course every year and I still do it, the instructors would always say, Oh, you know, you take it and you probably won't need to use this stuff, but you, you have it, so you yep. know, right? <laughs> yeah, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll use it. Uh, you'll use it in ways that you don't expect. But that was... I actually... I really enjoyed being a lifeguard. I had, I've had moments recently where it's like, boy, it'd be neat if I could be a lifeguard again Tuesday nights or something just because just I enjoyed what it was, what it meant. So I'm not sure I understand what using CPR in ways you don't expect is. Like, like you oh. have to, like, resuscitate a watermelon? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I mean, like, CPR, using the CPR training course, because in that they teach you all sorts of oh, things. Oh, yeah, so that that That's what I mean, to, to clarify. And I'm just like, no! You will live. We, <laughs> I know you're full of water. But we can bring you back. We'll get you to breathe. Have you ever played the watermelon game with elastics? I don't know what you're talking about. I saw a video of Future podcast. Yeah, I saw a video Oh, man. Oh, it's a game. Yeah. Oh dear! It's oh, yeah. very messy. It has Tell us a outside. thrilling tale outside. of corn detasseling. Uh, <laughs> no, corn detasseling didn't last very long. Uh, my brother was twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah. No, no. no. Oh, we, I think we lasted two weeks, and then my brother uh, wasn't called back for the second week, but I was, or uh, for the third week. So I said, "Well, I'm not doing this by myself." So I just quit. <laughs> I mean, I was like 14. I didn't need the money at the time. Uh, let's see. Uh, the closest brush I had with death was not a job, but the, I guess the second closest brush with death was I worked at a conservation area for two summers. And in the second summer, because um, it was a conservation area that had campgrounds, and so weekend campers would come down and uh, you know, booze would happen. And this guy, he... I'm pretty sure he was drunk, but he had to have been on something else, and he was right mad about something. And we go down to like calm him down, and I think we were going to ask him to leave, but uh, and he was like pacing his campsite with an axe. Eep. And we're just like, what are we like? I'm what seventeen at most. Like we're just sitting there. What are we supposed to do? Oh no, no, I was old enough to drink, so I was at least nineteen. All right, because uh, I, I do remember Fair. we we did drink. At, like after work and stuff like that, we could legally procure alcohol. Um, so, but still, nineteen. Still, how are you supposed to, to do this? So, I don't distinctly remember what was said. Um, I imagine it went something like, <laughs> <laughs> "Yeah, I You're just like, excuse me, sir. Uh, never mind. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just remember. Yeah, it was it was pretty hairy, and I went home feeling a little bit like a badass. We didn't fight or wrestle or anything, but eventually, uh, eventually. I think he left. I don't even know if we had to call the cops. Eventually, he left. There was a that is pretty badass, man. He left. I'm 19, and, and we were staring at a guy with an axe who was staring at us, and he was pissed. Yeah, one time I met a guy who was waving an axe around. Didn't get killed. There was the one time I I started to chase a guy in the dark. It was a bunch of drunk guys who got into a fight with an, um, with our. There was I think three of us, three or four of us working at night. One of them went down to the campsite to probably tell him to do something. I was. In the one of the washrooms, and I got a radio call, so I booted it down there. And there was a guy who came running like at me in the dark because he didn't really see me. And then I, he, he managed to get around me, so I started chasing after him. And then I'm like, wait, no, 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 my <laughs> my coworker, I need to make sure he's fine. So I run back to him, and yeah, he'd been like pushed into the fire, and then he tripped over the fire and face planted off the back of a pickup truck or something. So we called the cops on that one, but I think the guys just kind of like they snuck out and left and whatnot. There was no real problems with them after that. Um, but that was less dangerous for me, more dangerous for my one coworker. So, mm. uh, but no, I've been fairly lucky with my jobs. They've all been fairly like WSIB compliant. Yeah, <laughs> not a lot of not a lot of brushes with death. I used to when I worked in I worked in a convenience store for a few years. Uh, during my under or just before my undergrad, actually, and there's something really delightful 
about catching someone in the middle of a crime. Mm. Uh, not a robbery. I've never been robbed. Um, I feel like as a six foot tall, like three hundred pound white dude, you don't get robbed a lot. But it also wasn't a high risk neighborhood. It was sort of middle class, and it was relaxed. Although I did catch a lot of shoplifters, and it was always kids. And uh, I did. So my mom worked in the convenience store forever, and uh, I learned to deal with these kids from her, which was, I would never call the police on a shoplifter. You were a kid, and you're like 12 or 15 or whatever, and I catch you in my store, I will catch you stealing, you know, you tuck a Snickers bar down your pants or something, I'm not going into your pants to get it. But I know who you are. And I know who your parents are. <laughs> These are middle class kids. No, all of them got allowance. All of them are in there all the time buying stuff. And then your parents come in, you know, 10 o'clock at night looking for chips or cigarettes or chocolate milk or whatever. And I'm like, hey, how's it going? And they're like, oh, you know, not bad. I'm like, yeah, your, your, uh, your kid was in here earlier. And they're like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. Tucked a Snickers bar down his pants and took off. They're like, what? <laughs> Excuse me? I'm like, yeah. They're like, did you call the police? I'm like, no. I'm telling you. So I never had to clean my parking lot. <laughs> um, nice. Because nice. I always had some kid to do it. You know, it's it's really sort of weird when you when you catch that upper middle class kid who's like sneaking a Snickers bar into his pocket with his PSP. <laughs> that was when the PSP first came out. Too. That's uh, like eight hundred bucks. It was pricey. Yeah. I'm like that's that's like two months of rent, and you're just oh. I'm gonna turn this on its head a bit. Times when you committed crimes is that does that count as a job? No, I don't know. When you were pulling jobs. That's a different life. Shh. Oh dear. <laughs> the secret confessions of Drew Ripley. The Back talented the- Mr. Ripley is my Drew Ripley cover band. That's fair. Back at the enter- that the, the family entertainment place where we had these, we had it was a beautiful setup. It was one of the best playgrounds I've ever I've ever seen. What people didn't know is we one of the nightly tasks you know, is always clean. It's actually what you do as an employee there is you clean. Yeah. It's all you do. Children are filthy. They, it's like pig pen all the time. And and if you're always cleaning and you're always vacuuming, it's no problem. But one of my favorite tasks, end of the night, place is locked up, everyone's gone home, we wax the slides. <laughs> we <You're> act- lobster! <laughs> well, the, the great thing is there was this black slide and it, it was beautifully steep and kids would know, like, first couple times in there you have kids like I don't know if I want to go down that and partially because it is dark this is a black slide not like a, a bright yellow slide where there's a lot of light and it, it dropped at a beautiful angle and had a nice banking turn and the, we found the best way to actually wax this thing was you would climb up to the top you would get your can of Jigaloo and you would literally just put it right behind you and spray as you went down it <laughs> now <laughs> if you did it right and and it's funny because the kids loved it. I mean, you'd hear them go, what? And, and if you could get them to leave the end of the slide and travel a little bit before they hit the cushion. And, like, you <laughs> skip their butt across the ground <laughs> like a stone. <laughs> well, the funny thing was the kids knew. Like, there were kids that were coming back specifically for that slide because they would know if it was waxed properly, you, <laughs> you could fly out of that thing. Listen, anyway. it's not really a slide unless I land in the ball pit. That's Basically right. is what I'm getting at. That's here. right. And and it's it's sort of a strange thing. You know, I, I I remember thinking, you know, what other forms of, of wax can we put down on this? And the nice thing about the jiggaloo is that it didn't cause stains. We found that it mm-hmm. would soak in and it, into the into the um, the plastic and it would be fine. I have no idea what you're actually supposed to do if you run one of these things. It's just what we did. And uh, 
I remember my older boy loving that. I remember parents being surprised how fast that slide was. Meanwhile, their little guy is running around the bottom having the time. They're like, let's do it again, Mom! And Mom's like, ah! Well, you do that thing at the, where you're like waiting at the bottom of this. So I'm like, all right, all right, Sally, just come on just down. Come just on come down. on down. I'm right here. I'm right... Oh! <laughs> <laughs> but that, that playground, I mean, it was... The guy who ran it knew what he was doing, and he was very safety conscious. Even though it sounds like a horrific story, and we oh no, that sounds great. That's it, was, as a child, that's exactly what I. It's was exactly like. what you want as a kid, and we had staff in the playground monitoring what was going on, and we would break up stupid little, you know, yep. tag issues, and and um, you know, and you'd find you'd always find little brothers and sisters that had gotten separated that were always really upset and you'd always find a few parents that or grandparents who were like oh my god I can't believe this is hurting me now help you know I can't find so and so uh, the smart parents were awesome they would come in um, there were a couple of them and, and they were just they were the best parents ever you'd see them come in and they'd be like covered in body armor they would have elbow pads and knee pads and jeez but you're crawling. You're always crawling. So imagine you're in a space that's about three and a half, four feet tall. You can't stand, but your kid can. Oh. Think of how fast your kid can go. And you've got to spend all your time on your knees. And yeah, it's padded. No, no. But, just, you know, like, send, send little Sanjeet into the ball pit with a periscope. Have fun. <laughs> no, no. The, those parents, they would go in. And they would have the best time, and the kids would have the best time, and they'd all go flying down the black slide at, at Mach 2, and it was the greatest thing ever. I feel like the black slide needs a barker. It does. It's like this this quiet like a- little person in a, in, a, in, a, <laughs> in a suit with a with a black sort of crooked hat who's just like, you look like you like danger. <laughs> Do you dare try the black slide? <laughs> <laughs> motions up the steps to the slide. <laughs> I remember as a kid, and this is probably why I like this job so much. As a kid, I would go to. Um, I only went to it like once or twice. the The Woodbine, the Woodbine family center. The Woodbine's got a big mall, and there's a there's a playground amusement park thing out front, and. I remember I wasn't on a lot of rides. It, it, it wasn't like I went in there and we spent a fortune on rides, but we did go into the little playground section because it was, well, as a kid, it felt like it was enormous. But I remember there were slides that were massive. They would be easily two to three stories and very lengthy, and, and there was a long process to climb up to them and so on. And it's a very positive experience. It's just a slide. We're just playing with gravity. There's no, there's nothing else. I feel like there, the sliding's but, a name. Like, like now, though, like the. Th- no, actually, I feel like back then the slide needs a name. Now the, sni- the slide, like, needs a Twitter account. It probably, it, like, yeah. snaps <laughs> your kid's picture as they're coming off the yeah! end and immediately <laughs> posts it to Twitter and Instagram yeah. with the hashtag, another victim. Yeah. Well, these were blue. These were blue slides. And they're still that seems there. That I think they're still there. And those aren't nearly as fast as the black slide. The black, because we... As as employees, whether we were supposed to or not, we prided ourselves in a fast slide that would cause squeals and just like, <laughs> like you had to hear that. There was nothing better than than hear and then having the kid come out the bottom, and it was like they were on, I don't know, they were on something like just wire. Like Wah! I feel like you go to that, you you, you go to other playgrounds at that point. Yeah. You, you know, like you do that thing where you you once you're a professional at something, you go to something. Where someone else is doing that thing, yes, and you're even if you don't want to judge them, you're immediately you are, judging them, yes. And it's like you go to another playground, and you're like, "Sorry, is this your? Is are these all your slides?" <laughs> I was my my son was here. He was looking for a fast slide. Do you have one? Do you do you have yeah. one? Well, we we wax this one. Uh huh. Uh huh. I, I understand. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's like thirty degrees. Yeah, yeah like it's just not, not, I, I I check the I check the angle and your slope's off. It's just not. Yeah. It's just not there. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're gonna we let it go. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be amazing. I mean, terrible. Obviously, like if you're that person who's like, what do you mean? That is our fast slide. Like, listen, have you heard of the black slide? You mean the black slide of Mordor? <laughs> <laughs> that one. I'm just. Filling my head with slide fiction now. It's fun. Slides are good. They give levity. I mean, I I do struggle with something similar to that. Like 
because I'm a balloon artist, my kids obviously can ask for anything, and I will make it if time allows and so on. So every now and then we will come across other balloon artists that may be starting out and, and not have as much experience. Yeah. And it's it's can very, you make me a ten foot tall dinosaur? And it's what? like kid, what? There's a real process, wow. especially when you're small and you you have a difficult time comparing things. You're you know my dad is a balloon artist and I am five. All balloon artists must be at this level. Mm-hmm. So how do you make sure that they're still polite for the individual on the other side who's still being an artist and still doing a good job to the best of their abilities, and not have the child say something horrible like? It's just a two balloon sword. I wanted one that's at least my size, and it's mortifying as a parent when that happens. Oh, I bet. And it happened to me once, and I felt very badly for the other artist because it just—it's not fair. You don't do that in polite society, and you know we joked about it, and it was fine. So it does take a process to go through it. So what you're talking about is totally legit. Yes. It is totally Sorry. legit. Uh, could I speak to the slide master? The, <laughs> the what? The slide master. The, the slide. You don't have a slide master. Oh. It's going to be hard to top the slide story, man. Uh, we can go into gross stories. Because, I mean, Never. I, I don't want to I don't want to just, like, waylay into bar fights, because the say la vie, I suppose. But uh, I imagine cleaning up, like, ball pits and stuff was probably pretty gross at times. Uh, well, as horrific as it gets, have you ever seen someone or had to clean up and barf in water? Uh, no. No, it's, no, no. it's generally not pleasant, but you know the chlorine is doing its job and it's staying in one place. If it happens in a ball pit, <laughs> yeah, and we were very good. We had a we had like these balls were cleaned regularly, and we had a way to keep them really hygienic because there was that concern. But I can tell you right now, if if a child releases biological matter in a ball pit, it is your worst nightmare. It is. It is horrifying, and it prepared me to be a parent. I mean, I can tell you right now, <laughs> diapers were easy after that moment. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm out of that Penny Arcade comic where they're like, this isn't a water park. At, at, at 6 in the morning, this is just a play structure. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I realized that a lot of my jobs were in and around alcohol and other people and stuff, so like there was a time when the servers at the... the hall at the golf course asked me to clean up in the guy's washroom where somebody started at the urinal and then made their way over to the toilet oh. while vomiting so I had to clean up that trail oh. and then uh, I cleaned up at the conservation area where people like to smear poo in the, the shower stalls or take a dump in the, the urinal you're ready to look after a two year old yeah two-year-old. and then the, 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 my favorite two-year-olds like, can't reach the urinal to take a dump in it can they <laughs> no but they can throw their poo yeah oh god I think my I think my favorite my favorite was one time at the bar they told me to go in and just check it out because it's not my job to clean up at the bar but I go in and check out the stall and I can only call it like rage vomit <laughs> so like imagine imagine like the exorcist but like super angry instead of trolling the priest so a person who just like goes into the stall and just like wants to just fuck shit up bends over and just like (laughs) (laughs) because it was at least a foot above the back of the toilet painted across the back of the wall I don't even know if any of it made it into the toilet it just seemed like what is this? This is a visit from drunk Gojira. Yeah, that's this. That was. I mean, I I felt so bad for whoever had to clean it up. Oh, but I, I assume a young it. priest and an old priest. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the only way you can clean that up is with a power washer. Yeah, and pretty a much. Suit. I mean, there's a difference now. See, if 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 a four year old has a horrible day, or you know they've had too much pop and they were in the playground or whatever it is. There is a level of innocence that comes with that, and, mm-hmm. and at the time I was a parent, and I could accept that very, no. very well. And I was actually generally more concerned for did the kid get to the parent? Mm-hmm. Has that been resolved so they can move yeah. forward? <laughs> when you're dealing with that, it's just a whole different level because presumably that was not a child. <laughs> that- well, at, at some oh. point, it reverses back to a level of innocence. Yeah. Well, well, I'm yes. so drunk, you're like maybe. Maybe I'm not sick to my stomach. Maybe I have mutant powers. <laughs> Maybe I'm about to breathe fire. Ah, it was or butterflies. Oh. So, so is, oh. is there a, is there a lesson here? Is is it? Have you dealt with with barf at work uh, in one of your twenty three jobs? I have never dealt with barf at work. I have in all my twenty three jobs. I have dealt with blood. 
Okay. Uh, I have dealt with a ton of poop, but I have never... Because in the bar, cleaning up... I, I was not custodial staff, so cleaning up barf wasn't my job. Yes. Uh, I had bars to fill. Right. And in, all my, in a lot of my other jobs, we didn't have a public washer. So the convenience store, for example, we, you know, I worked at the convenience store for a long time. We didn't have a public washer. Um, but it did have one particularly memorable time. Uh, I worked at a Zellers back when there were Zellers. It was a shipper receiver one Christmas. And it turned out that shipper, when you're a shipper receiver, you're the only employee with arms. Um, it's probably not true. It takes arms to operate a cash register and it takes arms to stock shelves. But what you wind up doing most often is uh, anything involving arms. So you're at the back unloading trucks like crazy because it's Christmas. So things are coming in every day. There's a new truck. Um, and there are only two of us. And then you're also getting called out to like wrangle the carts in the, the front room, uh, like in the parking lot and things like that. <laughs> Which, while a refreshing change of pace, meant that you weren't emptying things off a truck which needed to leave so that the second truck could come. But once we got a call to go to the bathroom. Go to the washroom for a cleanup. We we rock, paper, scissors for it. I lost. I did indeed lose. Now, I'm not super off-put by, by that kind of thing. I mean, I've seen enough of it in, in jobs that I don't really care. It's not that big a deal. Um, but I was worried for this person who had apparently become some kind of butt volcano. <laughs> it was it oh. coated the inside of the stall to a height of about four feet on three sides. It was layered. And it was not... It had clearly not been spread or thrown. It had clearly, in my CSI, the bathroom sense, you know, I didn't bring out the (laughs) ultraviolet flashlight and take off my glasses with a cool-ass pun. (laughs) But, I mean, it had clearly sprayed. Like, someone had... It was like they had hung in the doorway of this stall, (laughs) clinging to life, and unleashed an anal (laughs) hellstorm. I have determined that my younger fans should probably not watch this podcast. (laughs) Oh no, it's cool, it's cool. (laughs) Anal hellstorm is my Spinal Tap cover band. Oh, okay, good. Oh. Um, but they, they had yeah they had just they had just unleashed this and I I it was I had mopped many floors in my life I've mopped and swept I mop and sweep at an Olympic level mm. uh, but I had never before mopped a wall <laughs> I, I happily it was like, it's not that bad to clean up you just no one wants to do it so you, you just, just get, do it you just get to it yeah and the downside is is once you do it you become the guy who does it yeah. To, you know, I'm going to point this out. You know, I don't know if our numbers for number of jobs we've had is, is above average, below average, whatever. I have a feeling it's above. I could be wrong. But there seems to be that for all of us we've experienced there's been another person that's had a very bad day, been in distress, and we didn't know about it, and we've mm-hmm. had to take yeah. the responsibility to clean it up. That's yeah. just, it's just what you do. So apparently if you have at least 14 jobs... This will happen. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is this is the poll that we have we have taken um, statistically accurate by three. <laughs> Clearly, I mean the, the sample size is is sort of sufficient. It, 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 it is though. Like like, like it had. A, it, I will say that, that to its credit, my incident had all the hallmarks of not of a person maliciously perpetrating an act of poop based villainy, <laughs> but. Which, which I can tell I you... I guess poop trading the act. As a parent, <clears throat> there are moments where a young, very young child, toddler, may be angry and there is an act of... Yeah, no, this was definitely so like is, like someone yeah, someone different... experiencing gastrointestinal horror <laughs> that... that Your word choice is... is, is needed to <laughs> unleash something 
deep within them. Well, it. I, I suppose it also comes with, you know, when you start out, or when you're going through your life, you you have to take on jobs that are dirty, they are messy. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to deal with stuff. Well, that was the, the, the sort of funny thing. I, I worked in a subway for a while, and I was a sandwich artist. It was a written and practical test. Yep. But uh, one of the things that we always encounter with with new new employees, especially younger employees, is like, I don't want to clean the bathroom. Mm-hmm. As a person who lived in an apartment, I clean my bathroom anyway. Yeah. So it's not that weird. Uh, and it really wasn't that bad because I had already witnessed the poop explosion, <laughs> and really nothing tops that. So I'm just like, huh. Oh. You just do it. Yeah. You just it's it is it is a thing that you do. It is a and thing. Yeah. As soon as it, I think. As soon as it becomes that, it sort of loses a lot of its power. There is a moment as a parent where you realize, once you've gotten through a couple dirty I'm going years, to be cleaning this up for quite a while. It's not a big deal. Or if you look after animals, if you've got pets, you know, mm-hmm. it's the same thing. There is a point where it's like, well, it's, it's got to be cleaned up. And you clean it and you move on. Much right. as How close is that with your coolest job story? Um, <clears throat> coolest, coolest. Um... I guess one of the fun ones that I remember when we were doing the pre-show was at the conservation area, um, and this was this was a great job, especially the second time around. But this story involves the first. But the second time around, we went around collecting beer cans all summer, and we threw a staff party just on the proceeds of making returning empties. Nice, uh, nice. and that was a lot of fun with all the the uh, lifeguards and, and everybody else that worked with us. Uh, but I guess one of my favorite. Stories was one night there was three of us working. It was like I think a long weekend or something. So there was three of us working the night security. So during the daylight hours, we would do maintenance. During the night, we would do patrols, and then towards the end of our shift, clean washings and go. Um, and so it was probably midnight or ever, and we're all chilling in the one parking lot. And all of a sudden, we hear um, some laughing, some women laughing, and out of the darkness from one of the campsites comes out these two women, drunk. In string bikinis, handcuffed together, <laughs> and we're just looking. Your life is weird. Yeah, and, and I think, so this would have been the summer when I was like eighteen, right? So and like you know, I was just like, it's like, what what's going on? Eighteen year old Ryan is thinking there are porno movies that start like that. And uh, guess what, eighteen year old Ryan? There are horror movies that start. My, like yeah, there are. <laughs> my, my older coworkers are all trying to be suave and stuff, and there's me. I take my, my flashlight and I'm like, uh, you're not allowed to have open alcohol off the campsites. <laughs> Because it was like a Vex bottle or something, and they're all like, hee hee, we can't find the key. It's, I'm just like, I don't know what to do. I really, I honestly. Just my, the facts, ma'am. My 18 year old brain just could not process it. <laughs> <Short out. laughs> it was too my, visibly shorts out. I, 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 remember, <laughs> I remember one of the bikinis was yellow, it was a Vex bottle. I, the, the, the rest of it is gone. That's it's just it's a haze. Gone. Burned red gone. Yeah, no, it was yeah. it was I remember they were attractive, but I don't remember what they look like. <laughs> so, but the I, moment is that and, the, the and, moment. and Jim is correct, you have a choice here. If you wish to reenact it, you can either start one type of movie or the other. Yeah. Uh, well it could have been it didn't have to be a slasher, it didn't have to be straight porn. It could just be one of those like teenage coming of age, you know, porkies meets the American. Okay, so like, it's a third in, this, yeah. in this in this Memory. Um, I did not. Young, get- Ra- young Ryan Huckle is played by <laughs> Michael Sarah. <laughs> it's just sort of Fair. extraordinarily awkward, holding up a flashlight, being like, "Uh, you guys can't be here. <laughs> you guys can't. Uh, you can't." If Michael Sarah's like s- over six feet tall and like two hundred and fifty or CG, so we'll pounds, we'll fix it up. We'll fix it up. Yeah, he we'll could, I, could, I guess I could be Michael Sarah. Yeah. So I think that's. Uh, I'm trying to think from another job if there was any other cool stories. I mean, there was the one time when I was in like a Tyvek suit cleaning up. There was a basement fire in a, a blood clinic, so because of all the chemicals, we had to wear these suits. That was just a really cool job because we had to go down into the basement, tear everything out. Right. We had to do decontamination showers. <coughs> um, we had air scrubbers that were uh, filtering the air like once every 20 minutes or something like that. Um, the f- it was it was hard work in the middle of August, so it was like Ooh. super sweaty with, with the suits. With well, the suits, yeah. and we had two kinds of suits. The first two weeks or so was Tyvek suits, which were not permeable. Yeah. Right. We had to, and it would be Tyvek suits, surgical gloves, duct tape, kitchen gloves, duct tape, hood up, 
mask over your face, duct tape that, duct tape the seam, duct tape the back, put boots, co- uh, boot covers over top of your boots, duct tape that, and then you write your name on the back so we all knew who each other was. And then within 20 minutes, I would do this, and sweat would just pour out of from under the gloves. Like, and it, I was not supposed to do it, but I would like cut a slit in my glove and then drain all of the sweat. Oh. Uh, and it was so hot. Um, but it was just... I don't know. I remember that fondly. It was a really cool job. I think it was just because I liked the decontamination showers because it felt like you were doing something really cool. Yeah. And I got to take a sledgehammer to like a million dollar centrifuge machine. Wow. Because we had to get it up the elevator and it was broken and we needed to like maneuver it so it was just easier to break it apart. I remember I accidentally, my, uh, my gloves were so wet from the sweat, I threw a, a, a sledgehammer through a wall. I mean, we were de- demoing the wall anyways. Yeah, but you lost. But I lost control of the hammer and it phew, went straight through the wall. So, yeah. I mean, that was, that was a, really cool. And How long were you in the suits for? Because I was um, at least eight hours. Well, so no, I wouldn't have been. I think the whole shift would have been eight to ten hours, but that was, we had to drive 40 minutes to the site. Right. We had to get dressed, uh, and then you. Uh, dressed up, went into the job site for four hours or so, came up, showered, took an hour lunch, and thankfully we were on University Row in, in London, so uh, bar, uh, I was going to say bars. Bars are near there too, but um, it was easy to find food, so you'd take an hour off, suit back up, go back down for a couple hours, come up, shower, and then everybody would leave the job site. So, And I did that for two or three weeks. One of the weeks was the first St- uh, like the the week back to high school, so I remember sleeping through a lot of first period because mm-hmm. I, I would work the late shift, mm-hmm. and then after about a week, it's like no, I can't do this. The money's great. There, that was you know seventeen at the time, and they were paying me twenty bucks an hour, right? Because wow. it was hard manual labor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, I love the money, but just with some level of risk too. So there, there would have been. Yeah, I mean, there was. Uh, I always, uh, as morbid as it sounded, I always wanted to get put on a dead body case. <laughs> just because uh, it was like forty dollars after hazard was it uh, forty bucks an hour after mm-hmm. hazard was attached to it, mm-hmm. and you would have to get special like bloodborne pathogen training and stuff. That would that would be like if somebody died on a couch and you had to go in and ex- extricate the couch. It's got death cooties basically. Well, no, yeah. there was there was the one time one of our crews had to go in, and it was a guy who had ho- held himself up in a house. I think he committed suicide. But the cops had also fired tear gas into the house. Ooh. So one of those things is you have to seal the whole thing off. You have to wipe all the surfaces down. Then you have to heat the room up to um, get the um, so like the tear gas stuff. I guess crystallizes when it cools. So they had to heat it up to get it airborne again, and then let it cool down so it resettle. And then they they had to do this like three or four times in order to properly clean Ooh. the house. Mm. So I mean, like those jobs. Those would, would have been interesting. The sad ones were always going into a person's house after a fire. Mm-hmm. Um, just because flooding in the basement is a hassle, but it's not the end of the world. Fire feels like a little bit more of a devastation because, you know, you're throwing you're away, again. Yeah, pictures or, you know, a lot of furniture gets ruined. So fires are always weird to work in. Floods, nah, whatever. There was one time the power had gone out in the Chatham area. And so, like, 90 basements had called their insurance companies because of flooding. And so they called in all the crews that they could. We went down. I think we hit 18 houses in one day. It was, like, 12 or 13-hour day, just incredibly long. And all it was was I knew a guy who worked there, and they needed people to go down. So I'm 16. I'm 16. I had work boots. Yeah, go down there. So it was just you go in, you rip up the carpet, haul it all outside, set up your fans and dehumidifier, and then leave the house, wait for it to to dry. And and you just hit the next house and the next house. Yeah, we, I did a couple jobs like that. Uh, there was a flood in London when the city crew had hit a water main. So a bunch of... Um, I, I could probably even point out all the houses. There was five or six houses that had flooded basements on uh, Oxford Street. So just going in there and tearing those ones up. So mm-hmm. those, were, those were interesting jobs. The manual labor ones I found were more interesting. Uh, the, work, like it, the work days went by faster. And generally the crews that you work on made it worthwhile they were interesting fun you know they as the young kid i was always i always get teased but they were good guys nonetheless so mm-hmm. uh, so i always enjoyed those jobs so so i've been thinking about ways to close out the podcast um and i figured like that it would be interesting to talk very briefly very very briefly about what we do now <laughs> so i work in software support uh, for a local, small to medium-sized software company. I basically get about 10 interesting problems a day, 
and I solve about seven of them, and I work with some really nice people. I'm really good at it, weirdly, and it makes me really happy. True. Everybody knows what you do already. They but, do? Well, I mean, we did introduce you as internationally known balloon artist ah. Drew Ripley. So there you go. That's what I do. Who can be found at DrewRipley.com or on Twitter at Drew Ripley. Or on Facebook. Same. It's yeah. fairly straightforward. It is pretty straightforward. Yeah. I make balloons. I go birthday parties and large events, corporate events, and I make giant stuff and tiny stuff, and my life is balloons and making fun and whimsy, and I love it. I'm so happy that I've been able to turn this into a thing that can support me and support my family, and it's good. It's um, it's funny because I, I can go back to our jobs and we've all got these crazy stories and sometimes those are good to keep me motivated to keep me in what I'm doing and keep selling and keep producing and keep providing the fun things one can make with balloons it's, it's I'm not tired of them either you know I grew tired of my other jobs in some aspect but this one I, I'm not because there's always other things I can do with them other structures bigger things I've got something cool planned for Maker Expo not going to say anything else but it <laughs> will be the biggest thing I've done in the area Ooh. Yes. Well, I suppose officially the tallest item I've ever made. Fair. I was gonna say big, like in big is the most important thing you've ever. Yeah, like big the, the tallest. Big thing. is a horrible adjective because it, yeah. it it can encapsulate a lot of potentials. I, I, I get pulled I did, in. I did say very brief. Oh, I'm sorry. I I, I could just talk <laughs> <laughs> balloons. He said I wasn't gonna have to talk about balloons, so I, I'm game. Yeah, like, no, let's go. I'm balloons. not making okay. you. All right. All right, Ryan. I currently work two jobs. One as a security guard, mostly door, uh, the door staff, so checking IDs and such. Uh, that's my night job, a couple nights a week. My big boy day job, I work at Conestoga College uh, in the newly created program assistant. My job is largely um, helping the college ensure quality delivery of its programs, and they do that through consulting industry members so I call meetings get them together a couple times a year and we discuss the curriculum review it and industry trends to help the college stay ahead ensuring that the students will have um, uh, or be have the market skills to be able to hit the job for us running yeah. alright leave your jobs or your weird job stories in the comments and we'll see you guys later I'm Jim I'm Ryan I'm Drew we're signing off stay awesome no. Three-way high five. <laughs> it's a little complex, but I have an idea. All right. I'll put one hand out, yeah. Ryan. That isn't quite what I was going for, but 